day is to be in the house of the Lord. It's so good to see each and every one of you and uh, so thankful that you've chosen to join us here for worship, whether you're online or here in person. Especially a uh, special welcome to our guests that are here online or in person. We're so glad that you've chosen to join us. If you are a guest, uh, we would uh, like to ask that you'd fill out the connection card. That way it gives us a little bit uh, knowledge a little more about you and then that way we also are aware that you came and visited with us. And then on the reverse side of that is a place where anybody can write a prayer request. We want to know as a staff how we can lift you up in prayer as you go throughout your week. Or if you have a praise, we do, we do accept praises sometimes. Uh, or we do accept praises, and so you can write that on there as well. If you're online, you can go nationalheights.com slash hello and fill that out as well. As I was thinking about uh, this week and just thinking about uh, just the different aspects and characteristics of God and just thinking about our response to that, and, and so a thought came to me that I think God gave me is that uh, as we think about who God is, who Christ is, our, really our only response is to worship Him. And so we're going to have the opportunity here in a minute. Uh, before I forget, as I oft, often do, uh, let me introduce today uh, J.C. Beckner is back with us to bring God's word uh, later on in the service. Josh, come please. Oh, Rob's going to come. It is nice to have J.C. back with us today. And if y'all didn't pick up one of these blue cards out near the entry door uh, to the sanctuary, uh, please do so. The prayer focus for this week, and you know it's been for a different age group uh, week by week through the month. <clears throat> this week is on young adults. And let's, let's bow our heads in prayer right now for that. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the young adults here in the church, here in our community. Uh, we just, you know, that's a, that's a hard time in life. And we just pray that um, you would give them wisdom, Lord, and, and that the Holy Spirit would speak to them uh, in whatever uh, need they have, that, that you would be 
at work in their hearts and their lives and help them to grow. Um, Lord, we pray they might uh, come to this church and find a place uh, where they can be part of a family, part of a community, Lord. And um, but, but mostly, you know, wherever they go, we just pray as you would speak to them, Lord, that they would find a church, the right church, that you want them to be in. We'd love it to be here, but if that's if if they're supposed to go somewhere else, we just pray, Lord, that they would be in a body of believers where they can uh, grow and be nurtured and and draw closer to you. Um, Lord, we know that you have a plan for each one of our lives. Uh, uh, Sometimes it's hard to follow that plan. Sometimes we drift off the track. But um, the Holy Spirit, we just pray, especially for young people at this time, but really for all of us, that, that the Holy Spirit pulls us back on the right track and that we are following your will in our life, not just what the TV says to do or whatever. Um, and we thank you for the Holy Spirit and how you can communicate to us through it um, if we just open our hearts and, and, um, and pray to you and listen, listen for you to speak to us through circumstances in our life or, or places like this where we'll hear the, the word of the Lord proclaimed later and, and uh, maybe be in a Bible study class. Lord, we thank you for Christ, his sacrifice for our sins, for the opportunity to share that with others. Um, we're, we're unworthy of that grace, but we thank you for it, Lord, and, and it's uh, a precious gift, and we just pray that everyone would, would accept and receive that gift, Lord. Lord, uh, thank you for the many blessings you bestowed upon us. We ask you to guide and direct and guard and protect each one here. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand. In the book of Ephesians, there's a passage where it records Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus. And he talks about that he would uh, pray for the glorious riches of Christ to, to strengthen them um, and that they might have um, Christ dwelling in their hearts, being rooted and established and be able to know and understand how wide, long, high, deep is the love of Christ. And then it ends the prayer with these words from verses 20 and 21. Let's say them together as a congregation. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus of all generations forever and ever. Amen. Remain standing as we sing, crown him with many crowns.
in the midst of uncertainty, our faith can struggle. Our walk becomes labored, our heart heavy. There's something about the unknown which seems to weaken us. It drains our patience and blurs our focus. Yet in the middle of everything stands a faithful God, a God who's not swayed by the struggle, who isn't moved by the winds of chaos, a God who remains faithful even when our faith is fragile. It seems more difficult than ever to not worry about tomorrow. Yet that's exactly what God has asked us to do. For when we cast our burdens on Him, the troubles of the moment begin to fade. When we trust the plans He has for us, our fear begins to subside. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, our focus becomes consumed by clarity. Yes, we are in the midst of uncertainty, but we can be certain of one thing. God is faithful. And that is more than enough for tomorrow.
Spirit, we all have my Father. What a certainty our anchor is when it is firmly founded in Christ. Oh, help us to do that, to put our hope, our anchor, our sure foundation built upon Christ. The rock, the solid rock. Father, as we open your word, we recognize that you desire to speak to your people. So we ask that you allow our hearts to be in a place to receive. Help us to settle in, to focus in, to receive um, the guidance of your Holy Spirit. And that you would show us the firm foundation as we look into your word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so very much. It's good to be back with you today, and I want to say thank you for all the past Sundays that you have listened and listened well and put up with me, and I appreciate that so very much. Uh, I uh, want to challenge you this morning by to think about your responsibility related to living in a world that's so troubled right now. How many of you believe that we are in a, living in a troubled world? How many of you believe that the United States is in trouble? Good, at least you're awake, you're listening, that's good. I wanted, I wanted to tell you this morning that I believe that God calls each one of us to stand in the gap. And there is a passage in Ezekiel that talks about standing in the gap. Now, if you're a football player, and specifically a linebacker, when that hole's opened up in the line and a, and a runner wants to run through there, a linebacker's supposed to do what? Fill that gap so that player can't run through there. It's to protect them from getting a touchdown. If you're not a football player, you probably have no idea what I just said, and that's okay. But you understand that a gap can be in a line. How many of you ever played that? Uh, what was that game where you lined up and had hands to hands, and you said, send somebody right over? Red Rover, Red Rover, send somebody, send Rob right over, or, or Harold right over, and the, the idea was to bust through the line. And they finally outlawed that game in, in our school because there were broken arms instead of busting through the line. So that kind of, but there was, it created a gap when you bust through a line like that. And the gap had to be filled in order for the person not to go through. Well, in Ezekiel chapter 22, I wanted this morning to challenge you to think about how do you live in, in a world that is so filled with immorality and sin and sin let's just say sin because sin will cover all those things that we could talk about how do you live in such a world and say oh god i wish i was out of this world sometimes i just want to say lord take me home i'm tired of all this stuff and uh, but that's really not the right attitude the attitude is we are as christians to stand in the gap we are to preach jesus to other people matthew 4 19 jesus said follow me and i will make you to become what fishers of men he said in Acts 1.8, when he told the, the, uh, the people that were waiting for the power to come, he says, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost what? Parts of the earth. So wherever you work, that's your uttermost part. You're to be the witness there. You're to stand in the gap. There are people all around you who don't know Jesus that are suffering and they want an answer to the world's problems. And Jesus is the answer. And if we don't preach Jesus, we don't share Jesus, then, then we're not doing the right thing. No matter how troubled the world is, I love the fact that there's peace when you're in God. It doesn't make a difference what's going around you. There's peace in the midst of the storm. The disciples discovered that when Jesus came to them in the water. And they discovered, how is it that this man can say, peace be still, and all everything uh, answered to the Lord Jesus. Listen, you have that same power of the Holy Spirit in your life, and there are people everywhere that need to know about Jesus. That's our responsibility. Would you agree? Great. Would you agree? Yeah. The Great Commission says, share the Lord Jesus. Don't go to sleep on me. We're not done yet, all right? <laughs> I want you to stand, please, and let's honor the Lord in reading his word. Ezekiel chapter 22, verses 23 and following. <clears throat> and this is the indictment of God's people in sinful land. And keep in mind, the context here is these are God's people and God is speaking to them and they have quit listening to what God wanted to tell them. And God's saying, isn't there anybody that will stand up and proclaim who I am so that the people, so I won't have to destroy this nation that I love. And I think he's saying that to America. He's saying that to us. We're to stand in the gap 
because our nation needs to hear about Jesus and not all the other stuff that's going on. So the indictment is this. In verse 23, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, say to her, you are a land that has not been cleansed, that has not received rain in the day of indignation. The conspiracy of her prophets within her is like a roaring lion tearing up its prey. They devour people. They seize wealth and valuables and multiply the widows within her. Her priests, that would be preachers, do violence to my law and profane my holy things. They make no distinction between the holy and the common. And they do not explain the difference between the clean and the unclean. They disregard my Sabbath and I am profane among them. What a terrible testimony that is. In verse 27, her officials within her are like wolves tearing their prey, shedding blood and destroying lives in order to get unjust gain. Her prophets plaster with whitewash for them by seeing false visions and lying divinations. And they say, this is what the Lord God says when the Lord has not spoken that. The people of the land have practiced extortion and committed robbery. They have oppressed the poor and needy and unlawfully exploited the foreign resident. I searched for a man among them who would repair the wall and would stand in the gap for, for me on behalf of the land so that I might destroy it. But I found, what's the words? No one. I found no one, he says. So I have poured out my indignation on them and consumed them with the fire of my fury. I have brought their actions down on their own heads. This is the declaration of the Lord God. Let's pray. Father. Help us today to understand the, the grave significance of what you're teaching us through a nation that, that defied you, who would not listen, and yet you are calling out and asking, isn't there anyone who would stand in the gap so that I might not destroy this nation? And Lord, I believe today that our nation is in terrible shape and that we have been called to stand in the gap. We've been called to stand up and declare Jesus Christ does it make any difference what kind of rules there are about not proclaiming Christ? We must proclaim Jesus. And Father, I pray that we might see that in our hearts and lives and live that. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Would you be seated? When God seeks for someone to intercede for, with him on his behalf of his sinful people today, it could be that God is calling one of you right here in this sanctuary or somebody who's listening online, God could be calling you and saying, I want you to stand in the gap for me. You don't know what the gap is yet, but God's calling. It's true that God calls people out of his congregation to serve him wherever he chooses to send them. And it could it be that some of you, God's been knocking at your door for 30 or 40 years, and you kept saying, oh God, I'm real comfortable where I am. Don't call me. I'll, I'll call you. But that's not the way it works. God says, I want you to go. And so we need to go. See, the context of the darkness of which God declared was that this nation was in such shambles and a terrible mess that even the officials, even the religious people, even the teachers, everybody was on the take. Everybody was hurting the people within the nation. And the nation just refused to listen. You know, there are many biblical passages in which God seeks out and appoints prophets and priests and kings and apostles and gospel heralds, people who proclaim Christ. But in the context of Ezekiel 22, God was looking for an intercessor who by his own appointment would block him from destroying that nation. What is God trying to say to us today in America? I don't believe he wants America necessarily to fall. But folks, if we don't stand up and proclaim the gospel, who's going to do it? Is God calling you to stand up and proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ? You see, the very plight of America today breaks my heart. To see our cities and our, our private property and lives being destroyed should break the heart of every American. But more than that, the plight of lost people who are flooding into our borders, the plight of lost people who are already here. Whether you like it or not, we got people coming to this country because it represented freedom to lots of folks. And yet, we've got to proclaim Christ in the midst of this. You know, people are lost, they're seeking something, and I believe they're seeking to find God, but they don't know it. And it's up to us to share that. So let me ask you, are you weeping and are you disturbed over the plight of where we are in our nation today? Are you? Oh, come on. Don't look at me like a calf staring at a new gate. Listen. 
the truth is we ought to be weeping. We ought to be hurting internally when I'm walking through my house or when I'm outside or playing with this new dog that we've got that we're probably not going to keep. By the way, it's a wine writer. I don't know if you know about those things or not, but the thing's got uh, energy at sometimes, and sometimes he doesn't. But and and he, he's a good dog. But I'm not talking about the dogs. We don't even talk about that. I got sidetracked. But in my heart, when I'm thinking and when I'm reading, I'm saying, "Oh God, our nation is such a mess. What can we do?" And listen, your neighbors and people that you're with, we ought to be on our knees praying and weeping, and saying, "Oh God, help us." I can't already watch the news because it's so discouraging to see what's going on in our nation. Would you agree? Yes. And yet, just watching it and not doing anything about it, we'll get on our knees and say, oh God, how can I fill a gap somewhere? What is it you want me to do? We ought to, be, we ought to be asking God, God, can I be the person that fills a gap for you someplace in Springfield, Missouri, whether it's at my job or at the church, where is it? Where do you want me to go to fill the gap? That ought to be the cry of our heart. Would you agree? Yes. It ought to be. So let me say on the record today that the problems that we're facing in America, they're not political. Oh, we're in a heap of mess with all the spinning and all the stuff that goes on. And maybe I shouldn't talk about politics. I'm not really talking about that. The truth is the problems in America today are really spiritual. They're not political. We have a lost, dying dark nation because people are not letting Jesus Christ reign in their heart. When there is no moral truth to live by, then your truth is always right no matter what anybody else says. Do you understand that? And listen, when we don't claim God as His moral truth and believe it and live by it, there are going to be difficulties and problems. If the people of the United States of America would live by the Word of God, a lot of the difficulties we're experiencing today would go away. And politicians would be right because they'd get saved and they'd know exactly what Jesus Christ wants them to do. So would pastors. So would staff people. So would government officials. So would teachers. If people would live by Jesus Christ's standards, our nation would be totally different. And I believe it was years and years and years ago. Okay. Have I offended you yet? <laughs> <laughs> See, my text, or the, not my text, the Bible text, reminds me uh, of the plight of the nation. And the plight of the nation is this. Ezekiel indicated five specific groups, he said, that encompassed all the segments of their society and spelled all the reasons for the disintegration of leadership in Judah. In other words, the leadership that wasn't leading. They were going their own way, doing their own thing. And that seems characteristic of where we are today. Listen. Princes, he said, princes, number one, they were the nobility, the ruling class of Judah. I don't know who that, I don't, in your mind, who you think that would be today in America. You could, you could figure that out. But these members of the royal house were responsible for ensuring that law and order had, had been promoted, but not murder, not robbery and greed. That's what they were doing, a lawlessness. That's what they were practicing. But they were supposed to be not letting those things happen. They weren't living by the word of God. They divorced God from their thought process. And these were only interested in personal gain. And they lacked concern for the consequences that befell the nation individuals. Well, it doesn't make any difference what happens to individuals. When I'm gone, it'll be theirs to take care of. That was the princess. And then there were the priests. These are the men for, responsible for instruction to teach the law, to tell them what the Word of God says. They were to do that. They should have practiced John 3.30. He must increase, but I must decrease. The Bible says that Jesus ought to be predominant in our life. But they weren't doing that. These were the men that were supposed to guard holiness and purity of the temple. They were to make clear a border between holy and profane, what was clean and unclean. They were to tell, but instead the priests violated the laws of God. They distorted the line between holy and profane, and they closed their eyes to the desecration of the Sabbath. They literally ignored everything the Word of God said to do. Boy, I tell you what, that will get you in trouble. If you claim to be a Christian, but you ignore the Word of God, that will get you in trouble. It's just a matter of time. And then there were government officials, it says. Officials is used in this context by Ezekiel to refer to those appointed as government officials rather than nobility. 
These officials were compared to wolves attacking and tearing their prey. They were supposed to serve the people, but instead had made them their victims. Now, if you don't like politics, blame the Bible, blame the Word of God, because right there it is in black and white. The politicians there in their day were messed up. You can draw whatever analogy you want about where we are today. I don't have to say that. You can figure that out, right? False prophets. False prophets. These should have been the people who proclaim in Christ and tell about who Jesus was. These were the guys that were supposed to be proclaiming the truth. And here's what the false prophets were doing. These spokesmen were to serve as the moral and spiritual conscience of the nation. Instead of preaching against sin, they gave false prophecies and lied and had divinations. They were, they were whitewashed in sin in general. In the face of the impending destruction of Jerusalem and the fall of Judah, they continued to preach, there's peace, there's safety. When they knew that wasn't the case, when there was wickedness going on everywhere. I don't know if you've ever been to Bourbon Street in New Orleans, but I remember as a college student going there and I thought, man, if Sodom and Gore was worse than this, I don't know how it was, and I, what am I doing here? Can you believe that a Baptist choir went on a tour and we went to Bourbon Street of all places? <laughs> well, that was from SBU, Southwest Baptist College at that time. Now we went down there to sing the seminary, we did, but we took a day tour not a night tour, a day tour. And I said, we need to get out of here. <laughs> this is the place where we should be. It would be like they, people going in there and saying, oh, this is peace. This is all right. There's morality here. Well, that's the furthest thing from the truth. That's where our country is. We're not at peace here. There's not peace in people's hearts. Would you agree? And Ezekiel's indictment was consistent with his earlier expose of the false prophets and the prophecies. And then the people of the land were the last ones. What kind of people should such leadership produce? If all of the people previous to these folks, the princesses, the government officials, the priests, the false prophets, were all lying, telling truths, and, and sowing false, what do you think the people of the land were doing? What were they acting like? They had become extortioners and robbers and oppressors. They subverted justice. The society was a showcase of violence, greed, indifference, of suffering, and general neglect of God's word. Is that a lot different than our nation today? I don't think so. There was no discipline in the homes. And if you look at 22.7, it talks about that. There was moral and sexual perversions and indiscretions. They were commonplace. And in 22.9-11, talks about crime and general lack of moral restraint was the order of the day. If you read the list of crimes that so thoroughly permeated the society of Ezekiel's day, you can see the parallel to our world today. There was abortion. There was priestly stuff going on that was worship of God, not of God, but of Satan and, and, and his throne. The nation had been marked by decadence and moral spiritual decay, loss of integrity, violence. It just mirrored everything that Ezekiel had said. And God was calling Ezekiel and saying, listen, Ezekiel, if you don't stand in the gap and if you don't speak up for me, I'm going to have to destroy this nation. Who is it that's standing up right now in the gap for the churches and for the people of this nation? Who is it? See, I think God's calling each one of us as Christians to stand up in a gap. I think we're wallowing in a, in a quagmire of our own making. There is injustice. There is violence. There's pornography. There's crime. There's abortion. And the list goes on and on and on in America. This is not who we are to be. And I'm not running for political office. I don't want a political office. I'm just telling you the word of God is very specific that we are not to be like this. And yet we're here we have a nation like this. So what do we do? The call of God. Scripture tells us that God was seeking a man. Verse 30 declares it this way. I searched for a man among them who would repair the wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land so I might not destroy it. But I found no one. The problem wasn't that God wasn't calling people. God was calling people, but they would not respond to God because they wanted to live their own way. They wanted to live their own life. Listen. I don't care if you live 20 years, 10 years, 15 years, 30, 60. If God's calling you, respond to him today. He wants you to stand in the gap. And you can't ignore the word of God. In 22, 30, and 31, 
Whenever there's such a moral and spiritual crisis that's ripped nations, God has always sought for a solitary individual who'd be willing to be used. He found that person in Noah. Remember how bad the earth was? And Noah, he called Noah. And Noah was a man that walked with God, but yet he was, he was just a man. Because right after he gets off the boat, two or three years later, he gets drunk. If you think, how can a man of God who was so close to God turn around and, and get drunk? How could that happen? But he used Noah. He used Moses. Moses, remember, what did Moses do when he was in Egypt? What did he do? Why did he have to leave Egypt? Come on, talk to me. Why? Yeah, he killed somebody, didn't he? And he ran. And he went worse, but God still called him and used him. Then you look at Daniel. And then you look at other men who God called to stand again. They were just men, but God called them. You say, I'm just nobody. Well, these people were nobody until God called them. And we read about them. And they served God. God's looking for somebody to take the lead and stand in the breaches of the wall so we wouldn't have to destroy the land. In Genesis 18, 22 through 23, God promised to spare Sodom and Gomorrah if there were just how many righteous people? Just 10. But he couldn't even find 10 righteous people. So the situation in Judah was even more serious. God was looking for just one person to stem the tide of immorality and stand before him in a gap. God's plan for reaching ungodly people and nations is still the same as it was in the beginning of time. He uses godly men and women to stand the breaches in morality and spirituality and make the difference by calling the nation and individuals to repentance, to faith, to righteousness, and commitment to God in Christ Jesus. And that is our job. If you are a Christian, if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, you have been called to fish for men. Sinful man. The only difference between myself and anybody else is that hasn't come to Christ is I'm a saved sinner, not a lost sinner. That's the only difference. I'm still a sinner. And so are you. But God's calling us. The people seem to have a spiritual stupor here. They listened eagerly to false prophets who promised them peace. But as a result, all they saw was more bad stuff because they listened to the wrong folks. See, they needed to pray for the nation. The problem that there was no repentance because they did not recognize their sin. Do you think people today recognize when they're sinning? Do you think, do you think people truly know what sin is? <clears throat> Listen, as I said earlier, if there's no moral law, if there is no law here to live by, you can't recognize what sin is. You've got to understand what God says about it. And when you recognize what God says about it, conviction comes and then you understand, I am a sinner, I am lost, I need Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. You see, if there's no conviction of sin, there can't be repentance. If there's no repentance, there can be no forgiveness. The recognition of our true state before God is absolutely crucial for salvation and evangelism. So what's the qualification to stand before God? It has to be righteousness. Now I want to tell you, I'm not a righteous person. I'm only right because Jesus Christ is in my heart and life. That's the only way I can be considered right. It's the only way you can be considered right because Christ in your heart makes you righteous before God because Jesus Christ is your righteousness. God demands our soul obedience because all other gods are false gods and will lead us astray. So the law then is, is restrictive only to, or in order to be protective. The law protects us is what it does. To see sin only in social or moral terms will never lead people to conviction. Sin must be seen in light of the law and the holiness of God. The gospel is not an aspirin for the aches of life to soothe and comfort people in their misery. That's not what the gospel is for. The gospel is to help us to see us for who we really are. And in the midst of that, thank God and, and for his grace to us. If you think salvation is a product of morality and religious observance, it's not. Salvation by works never creates conviction of sin. It fails miserably to take into account the holiness and the purity and justice of God. You read that in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We're saved by grace, not by works, for sure. 
You see, it only sees sin as a moral and social blemish and not as an offense to the word, law, and character of God. It is the law of God which produces conviction because it shows us our sin in relationship not to society and people, but specifically to God. If I have nothing else and I stand before God, the only thing that makes me righteous is Jesus in me. Without Jesus, I am totally unrighteous before God. And so are you. And listen, because we're sinners, the law of God seems obnoxious to us or extremely unpleasant to us. Now, why is that? Well, the law of God is right. It helps us see who we are. See, the absolutes of God's law defy human thinking. They will not appease the conscious and leave that person forever uncomfortable in the presence of God. I've heard people say, well, I don't want to make this person feel bad. I don't want to offend their feelings. Listen, the gospel is offensive. The word of God is offensive because it puts us in a right place. And then we have to come to some point of being submissive to God and say, God, you're right. I'm wrong. God, you're right. I'm wrong. Say it with me. God, you're right. I'm wrong. Oh, is it hard? Come on. God, you're right, and I'm wrong. One more time. God, you're right, and I'm wrong. Listen, if you can't say that, is there this pride in your heart that says, well, I'm not going to do that? Listen, you're in trouble. You better go back and see what the Word of God says because we are to be submissive to our Heavenly Father. See, the purpose of the gospel is not always to make us happy, but to make us righteous in the sight of God. The Apostle Paul would say this, Therefore, there is no way the gospel can be preached without the law also being preached. It is the only preaching of the law <coughs> excuse me, that shows people what their problem really is, since it is through the law that we become conscious of sin. Wow. In this day, <coughs> in the day of this text, in the day of Ezekiel, there wasn't one godly man in king's court or among the priesthood or among the leadership. I think that's unusual. In an institution or a nation or a people or a movement is always the length and shadow of a man. When Billy Graham passed away, I don't know if you know much about Billy Graham and his life, but he, have, he influenced this nation. He influenced many presidents. He was a man who stood in a gap, regardless of what people said. And I watched how he went overseas in a documentary where he was told that he couldn't say certain things in a communist country, and he stood up for Christ and proclaimed it anyway. He was bold. Listen, what would England be without a Churchill? Not that he was a Christian, I don't know that. But Churchill was not pop, a popular man. What would America be without George Washington or Abraham Lincoln? They stood in a gap. What would Lutherans be without Martin Luther? Or the Methodists be without John Wesley? Or what would the Salvation Army be without William Booth? What would our Baptist people be without Roger Williams or, or Charles Haddon Spurgeon or George W. Truett? In every age, in every nation, in every institution, in every moment in life, there is always the vast repercussion of a man or a person, a man, who influences a nation for God. What would have Israel been like without Moses? Think about it. In Psalm 106, 23, when they made that golden calf and took off their clothes and danced naked like heathen around that image, God said, I will destroy them. What kept them from being destroyed? Moses stood in the gap and said, oh Lord, you can't do that. For the sake of your name, you can't do this. And then in the 160th Psalm, the 23rd verse, therefore God said he would destroy them had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach to turn his wrath, lest he should destroy them. He stood in the breach, Psalm 106, 23. There's a wonderful poem that expresses this so beautifully and vibrantly. And it's not a poem I wrote, but I want to share it with you. It says this, give me a man of God, one man whose faith is a master of his mind. And I will right 10,000 wrongs and bless the name of all mankind. Give me a man of God, one man whose tongue is touched with heaven's fire. And I will flame with the darkest hearts with high resolve and pure desire. Give me a man of God, just one man, one mighty prophet of the Lord. And I will give you peace on earth, brought with a prayer, not a sword. Give me a man of God, one man, true to the vision that he sees. And I will build your broken shrines and bring the nations to their knees. Give me one man. It was written by George Liddell. It's an unusual thing in this earth that God and one man are always a majority. 
God and his one man are always a majority. We should never forget that. See, it was so in the days of Noah, when the whole earth was filled with violence, but Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord, Genesis 6, 8. That was true in the days of Abraham. It's hard for me to realize in the days of Abraham, the entire earth was idolatrous. The whole earth at that point. But God and one man. And it was true in the days of the story of the young David. He stood in the presence of Goliath and the great Philistine army back of him. And David said, you come to me with a shield and a spear and a sword. But I come to you in the name of the Lord that you have defied. One God and one man. True in the days of the Apostle Paul facing the entire world, the civilized world, the Greco-Roman world of paganism and heathenism and idolatry facing it with the gospel of Christ. Seems to be an unusual thing, but listen, it's God and one man. Listen, it's God and Christians standing in the gap wherever God's called you. And here it is in the book of Ezekiel. The people hopelessly buried in slavery and captivity. And Ezekiel rises with the son of the living God in his soul and the message of salvation of hope in his heart. Now he speaks not only of a man among them, but he speaks of that man as standing on the breach, standing for somebody else. You see, only God's Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, will have credentials sufficient to do what no other man can do. Only Jesus Christ can stand in the gap and the breach for you would it not be for Jesus Christ, none of us have a prayer. We could never stand in the presence of Almighty God without the Lord Jesus Christ. Only God's special man, only the Lamb, Jesus, was worthy to judge and deliver us from judgment. This man, God later sins, will build up all that offers protection to those he delivers and stand in a gap making intercession. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father right now. He says, oh, don't forget, don't forget, that's Harold, that's Brian. That's dying. That's, those are the people I died for. I love them, Lord. They're okay. And God says, all right. Because of his righteousness. You see, prayer is the instrument and the agency by the medium which God does his work. His saving work in the earth. You know, uh, uh, Rob got up and shared about praying for the younger couples and, and people today. And the church praying. And we ought to be praying for that God would send people to stand in the gap maybe you should be praying this god if you want me to stand in the gap somewhere show me where the gap is and i'll go i'll proclaim jesus christ i don't care what people say i don't care if it's an agency where we're not supposed to proclaim christ i'll proclaim christ not because we want to get arrested or thrown in jail or something like that but because god says do it and we go do it are you praying for people Paul Cho, who's a pastor from Korea, spoke about an hour and 15 minutes. An American pastor was there, came up to him and said this, Paul Cho, I cannot understand why it is that I have a Sunday school, I have an attendance and a worship hour of 500, and you have 50,000 people. And Paul Cho said to him, how long do you pray? And he said, I pray about 50 minutes a day. And Paul Cho replied, I pray five hours a day, seven days a week. And maybe the difference between the 500 you have and 50,000 is I have a difference between 50 minutes and five hours. Five hours a day in prayer. Think of what the Holy Spirit could do through you. Think of the homes that you could visit. Think of the work you could do. Think of the errands you could run. Five hours a day spring before God in prayer to us is probably unthinkable. Some of us would say, in 10 minutes, I've run out of all things to say. Do you know prayer is not about you saying everything you want to say to God, but it's about God speaking to you. I heard Charles Stanley say this morning, as I was kind of viewing a little bit of what he said, we have a hard time being quiet. We have a hard time listening to God because we have our agenda. And he's right. The great preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon was asked, how is it that the blessing of God is so mighty upon your ministry? And he replied, my people pray for me. A precious thing to do and a beautiful thing to do is to pray for others. In the 10th chapter of the book of Romans, the first verse, Paul begins, brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God concerning them is for their salvation. Interceding, asking God, praying before the Lord and dear God. How many are there who are lost or wayward or confused or unhappy, completely miserable, needing God? What is that like in America? It's tough. Last thing, the gap filler. Who's the gap filler? The most important example of standing in a gap before God comes in the life of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. His purpose for being born was to stand in the gap for us, for the sin of our life. That's the ultimate gap of standing for sure. 
Our sin left us vulnerable to divine punishment, but Jesus willingly offered his life. Jesus came not, Matthew 3, 17 says, to condemn the world, but the world through him might be what? Saved. Might be saved. Our sin has left us vulnerable to divine punishment. But Jesus changed all that. That's the wonderful story of the gospel. While we were still caught in our sinful nature, when our defenses were obliterated and divine justice was sure to sweep us away, the blood of Jesus Christ stands in the gap to protect us and restore us to God. His sacrifice continually offers the only path to restoration before God. And Jesus himself stands before the throne of the Father, advocating on our behalf and vouching for all believers. And thus he would say to you and to me, stand in the gap and share my word, share my mission with those who are lost. Listen, the gospel is always going to be offensive to those who don't want to hear it. But the truth is we share out of love for those who don't know Jesus Christ so they can have the opportunity for Jesus to stand in the gap for them. We don't want anybody to Christ. The Holy Spirit does. Just share the gospel. Just share Jesus. And in order to do that, you have to accept Christ first for the atonement and sacrifice for your own life. That's the first and most important step, recognizing that we're powerless to stem the tide of judgment and acknowledging that we need a great Savior, that, that we could never be for ourselves. I needed Jesus to stand a gap for me, and so did you. And then to follow the example of Christ and stand a gap for others, we begin by teaching them about the gospel. By lovingly but directly confronting the sins in their lives and pointing them back to God, saying, listen, I'm a sinner, but so are you. And the Bible declares that. Listen, but Jesus has the answer for you. Here it is. His blood was shed on Calvary just for you. And if you'll come to him, he'll cleanse you, and you'll be forever righteous before God. Boy, isn't that great news? Come on, isn't that great news? Let's not keep it here. Let's share it. The best way we can stay in a gap really is not just those things, but through prayer, intercessory prayer. It's nothing more than speaking to God about someone else's behalf. And it's the best and most effective way we can follow Jesus in standing on behalf of others, advocating for them before our God, standing in the gap. A nation who needed somebody to stand in the gap, protect them from God decimating the nation. America needs gap standards, gap fillers today, and God's calling us to do that. Would you agree? Let's stand and pray. Father, today we come to you and say thank you for your love for us. Ezekiel's message was clear, so clear, that if there is not someone who would stand in the gap, that your mighty judgment's going to fall. And God, I, I think you're calling us. I think you're saying to us, get up, stand in the gap. First of all, get right with me through my son, Jesus Christ, who sacrificed his life for me. And God, today it could be that there is someone right here uh, in this church or someone who's watching online that needs Jesus Christ, that they need the blood of Jesus to cleanse them from all their unrighteousness so they, Father, will, can come home and be with you when the time comes. And Lord, if that's true, I pray today your Holy Spirit would bring conviction and they'd come to you and say, Oh, Father, forgive me for my sinful condition. I accept your sacrifice. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. And I pray that he come to my heart and life and save me. Lord, it could be today that somebody here that needs to hear that, I'm sure of that. And Lord, would you convict them? It could be, Father, today that you're calling some other folks here in this place. And those who are listening on, you're calling out to them saying, look, I need you to be a gap filler. I need you to go to this place. I need you to do this at work. I, I need you to do this in your family. God, you're calling on them. And I pray your Holy Spirit will convict them and they might respond and say, yes, Lord, yes, I'll, I'll fill the gap for you. And then, Father, it could be that we're just guilty of not being that concerned. That we're not really convicted of the mess in the world. That we're, we're, we feel safe where we are. But yet, Lord, the world which we live is not safe. Father, help us to understand that as a Christian, 
The things that we're suffering in this world right now are the worst things that we'll ever suffer, but the best things are yet to come when we come home to you. But Lord, help us also understand to see that people who are lost, this is the best they'll ever see, and the worst is yet to come if they don't accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now, Lord, convict our hearts today. Move us to either pray or, or to stand in the gap for you or come to Jesus as for our Lord and Savior. And Lord, it could be that there's somebody here today that you want to be a part of this church. If that be the case, move them to come. Father, we commit this time of invitation to you, and it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. If God's speaking to you about something specific that you need to deal with, you need to come and pray. This altar is open, or you need to come and talk about receiving Jesus Christ. Don't put it off. Grab a brother or sister. Come and pray. The altar is open. You do what God directs. Let's see. Simply trusting every day, trusting through a stormy way, even when my faith is small, trusting Jesus as JC for that powerful message uh, just some challenges to stand in the gap this week uh, just a couple of things real quick it is good to see you guys and especially our visitors if you're a visitor I'll be over here at the back sanctuary that has a gift for you as a token of our appreciation of your visit today if you're online you can fill out the connection card and we'll connect through th with you through that way if you're part of a committee any committee here at at National Heights we're going to have an all committees meeting here tonight starting at six o'clock in the fellowship hall and then i need help with an opportunity this week to be a uh, part of something in the community on thursday october 21st um, they're having a, a fall festival event at reed academy um, which i've had the blessing to be a part of opportunities there um, and so they they're have invited us to come and and decorate trunks and be a part of that um, outreach event um, they're not calling an outreach event, of course, but it is an outreach event. So I encourage you, if you're interested in being a part of that, and so on October, Thursday, October 21st from 5 to 7, you can let me know, and that way I can let them know how many people that we're going to have involved so I can make sure they have enough parking spots for that. So just an, important, an opportunity to be involved in, in our community. So. Um, Ralph's going to come and give our offertory and closing prayer. If you have an offering, you can leave it at the back of the sanctuary. God, Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for all your many blessings. Father, thank you for this day. Father, be with those that are unable to be here today, be eat illness, or whatever the reason, Father, you know, living. Father, we just ask you to bless this offering to do your work, Father, and we just ask you to dismiss us with your blessing. We ask all this in your son's name.